So, um, I remember starting this series in, um, in November on a rather dark winter's evening and talking about men in black. And now it's a rather gorgeous um, spring day. It feels like the middle of the afternoon. And we're going to be talking about the girl of the period. And I hope for you, for those of you who've been following the series, that um, at this point uh, you have some sense of the material that I've been looking at and the arguments that um, I've been trying to present to you. So, back to a slide that we looked at last week, William Powell Frith's The Times of Day, number two, Noon, Regent Street. In this series of lectures, I've been discussing the role of fashionable dress and appearance in defining men's and women's social and moral identity in the middle decades of the 19th century. As we've seen in the series, this was a dynamic period when the system of seasonably changing fashion with which we're now so familiar became established and when the streets of modern cities such as Paris and London became what you might describe as stages for the performance of fashionable display. With the introduction of new forms of window display and wider pavements, major cities in this period were beginning to be the visual feasts that they are today, and men and women visited the city to look and also to be looked at. And I'll be thinking about that sort of self-conscious um, fashioning and display um, throughout this lecture. It was in this environment of visual ostentation and almost promiscuity that more traditional and conservative commentators claimed that there were indeed visible distinctions between the respectable and the non-respectable, that even though the crowds on the city streets seemed much more congested and heterogeneous, details of dress and appearance could be observed and read, and an individual's moral and social identity clearly determined by these outward signs. And this was something that I discussed in um, the last lecture. In the previous lecture, I looked at the woman in red, the dress and appearance of the fallen woman, and how, through the repetition of particular physical elements, such as the showy or gaudy dress, short skirt length, kid boots or feathered bonnet, across a range of discourses, including novels, medical texts and paintings, a stereotype was established of the sexually deviant woman that suggested that once a woman had fallen from virtue, she became visibly separate from respectable society and was trapped in an inescapable downward progress until she met a tragic and premature death. That's this a really quick sketch of this sort of mythology of the life and death of the prostitute. And in the slide that you're looking at now, um, this is one of a, a series of contrasting images um, produced around 1850, as I was and as I am. And you can see as I was is this stereotype of the street walker, the um, rather sort of plump ankles, the short kid boots, the wide skirt, the boldly contrasting outfit, walking into the Argyle rooms, which were very famous night uh, dancing rooms in London, as I am, shows that she's on that downward progress. She's having to pawn those gorgeous clothes. Um, and the idea that she might end up in a park um, just on the streets and as a lower level of prostitute just before she, she uh, you know, dies this awful death, is really sort of encapsulated in this contrasting image. Ideologically, the importance of this myth of the dress and appearance of the prostitute was the way in which it functioned to differentiate the pure and the fallen. 
and through its claim that these differences were visible and permanent and an outward expression of moral character. So this is a really important theme, the idea that the way you looked um, and even your manners and deportment were an expression of your moral character. Um, there was a, a, an idea that sin would literally break out onto the surface of um, the sexually deviant woman's character, uh, body, sorry. And yet, this system of visible distinction seemed to be constantly breaking down, faced with the social actualities of the streets in the mid-19th century city. Rather than prostitutes and fallen women being clearly distinguishable, there were endless cases of mistaken identity. And again, those of you who um, have seen last, the last lecture um, will know this wonderful print um, from around 1865, a scene in Regent Street where a respectable woman is simply waiting for an omnibus, but an overzealous clergyman comes up to her offering her a Bible and trying to um, uh, sort of uh, recruit her and take her away from her life of sin. And she says, bless me, sir, you're mistaken. I'm not a social evil. I'm only waiting for a bus. I also mentioned in that last lecture the numbers of wrongful arrests by policemen who simply mistook the identity of women who were walking home from work or simply around in the city. And because of that presence, they were arrested um, for soliciting. Um, when these cases came to court, the judges said, you know, you've made a mistake and you've made that mistake because you've assumed things by their appearance. So police were simply unable to tell whether women were prostitutes and soliciting clients, or if they were simply modern women adopting new kinds of style and behaviour. So this system of visible distinction was under attack because modern women were present on the streets of the city in ways that transgressed traditional moral standards and expectations. They didn't act in or look the, way, the same that girls had done in the past. Fashionable femininity threw a spanner in the works of conservative discourses of gender and morality. These were women who followed the latest fashions and flaunted their looks and clothes. They weren't modest, they weren't retiring, but they were bold and flaunting. Modern, young and advanced, these were women who had been created in part by the fashion system and in part by the streets of the great capitals. In the second half of the 19th century, Paris had produced a new kind of citizen consumer, the Parisienne, a chic, modern consumer of the latest fashions, a woman who had honed her, ex her expertise in accessorizing and who had turned women's dress into a religion. Although in one respect, the fashionability of the Parisienne supported French commerce and manufacturing and was a symbol of the French consumer economy that was circulated both nationally and internationally, on the other hand, its superficiality and idolization of appearance eroded the more traditional values that celebrated moral and spiritual excellence over cut of cloth and choice of hat and gloves. It was a world in which appearances were no longer necessarily indices of respectability and in which mistakes could and would be made. So this is um, a cartoon, a comic cartoon, from um, Le Monde Comique, published in about 1875 to 6. Um, a woman of the world and a cocotte. Bah, which one is the cocotte? And of course, it's parried, parodying precisely that contrasting as I was and as I am before and after image. Because here, the woman of the world and the cocotte are simply mirror images of each other. Um, and in a sense, 
the viewer, the reader of this image, is the voice of the caption. We don't know, bah, which one is the cocotte? And here in a little sort of comic strip, a man who follows women uh, from La Vie Amusante of the same uh, period, 1878-9, in this little comic strip, um, a, a man takes a fancy to a woman in the street, doesn't know her, he's got about 10 francs on him to pay for her, but he begins to be uncertain about whether she's sexually available or respectable. So you can see in the um, second image in the centre, um, the Dickens, she has the air of being an honest woman. That's charming, but annoying. And it's the idea that manners aren't authentic anymore. Um, is this woman simply um, posing? Has she adopted a certain kind of air? Or can you actually accurately read the way she looks and behaves? Anyway, he trails after her, trying to pluck up courage to speak to her, and in the end, he gets a door in his face. I really don't have any luck. I always happen upon honest women. The Parisienne appeared in both the mass media and in avant-garde painting, on posters, advertising Parisian department stores, journals, and catalogues. As art historian Ruth Iskin observes in her book Modern Women and Parisian Consumer Culture in Impressionist Painting, one department store actually called itself La Parisienne. And this is um, Jules Chéret's poster for the store, which shows the way in which this figure of the fashionable Parisienne, and I quote Iskin, with her regalia of up-to-date fashion and accessories, was used to attract female customers. So it was circulating enough for it to be kind of cited and then used as a way to um, attract female customers. As Iskin comments, and I quote, the message was that by buying the constituent items, composing them and thus emulating the image, any department store customer could become a chic Parisienne. And I think you can probably see that um, at this point in um, consumer culture and marketing, we're beginning to uh, see a world that um, is recognisably the world that um, we also are familiar with. So the Parisienne was a figure of highly conflicting associations. On the one hand, she was an icon of the modern French consumer economy, and of the link between France and haute couture that was being marketed as a global brand. On the other hand, she was so wrapped up in her endless search for the latest ensemble and matching accessories that she had lost her moral compass and was no better than and could not be distinguished from a high-class prostitute. We'll see a similar set of ideas emerging in the context of British discourses on fashionable femininity. This is Renoir's The Parisienne, 1874. In 1874 to 5, both Renoir and Manet painted full length versions of the modern Parisienne. Both images are painted like fashion plates, with no figurative background. All the visual attention is drawn to the women in their fancy day dresses, with their incredibly moulded silhouette, cinched waists and high buttoned collars. So these are really figures of modernity through femininity and fashionability. And you can see that um, in both of these pictures, in this Renoir and in the Manet, the gaze is quite direct towards the viewer out. These are not women who look down. These are not women who look away. They're women who engage um, with the public. This is Manet's Parisienne of 1875. As the wonderful catalogue to the 2013 exhibition Impressionism, Fashion and Modernity points out, interest in women's dress was at its height in the second half of the 1870s, with writers such as Baudelaire and Mallarmé describing fashion 
as a symbol of the fleeting modernity that characterised the contemporary city. The chic women portrayed by Manet and Renoir might, might be members of the grande bourgeoisie or women of the world. They might be wives or courtesans. The point is that whatever their identity, regardless of their social status, all modern women seem to prize elegance and the art of dressing above all else. In the 1880s, James Tiso executed a series of 15 paintings on the themes of Femme à Paris, which can be seen almost as the apotheosis of fashionable French femininity in this period. Tissot had left Paris and moved to London in 1871 during the Franco-Prussian War, where he established his reputation as a painter of scenes of fashionable life and high society, and where he stayed until 1885, when he returned to Paris and planned his major one-man show. <coughs> Tissot's Femme à Paris is a sort of taxonomy of contemporary fashionable femininity, a selection of female types in a range of modern settings that define what it is to be a late 19th century woman in Paris. The women in these images are always impeccably dressed and aware of themselves as objects to be looked at. I mentioned this theme at the beginning of the lecture. In this image, l'ambitieuse, the political lady, you can interpret that whatever way you like, Tiso skillfully depicts the different textiles, the accessories, and it's almost a painting that's about surface texture, all of these luxurious surfaces worn by the woman, the tears of stiff, stiff pleated flounces contrasting with the soft feather fan. She enters the, ar at the room on the arm of an elderly man and turns towards the viewer of the painting, acknowledging the attention that she's aroused both among the figures around her and, of course, the um, viewers of the painting. So this kind of really um, sort of fraught, almost electric atmosphere as this woman enters the room um, and the gossip, you know, men sort of about to whisper behind their hands. Very, very rude. The way in which fashion is used by the femme à Paris is the subject of other paintings in Tissot's series, such as this one, La Mondaine, the woman of fashion, the woman of the world. Here, again, an extremely fashionable young woman is accompanied by a much older gentleman. Lace, fur, velvet, and exquisite detail. I mean, look at the pattern on the carpet contrasting with the um, geometric black and white squares of the marble floor. It's all about surface and decoration. This exquisite detail is part of the woman's, woman of fashion's sort of armory, her weaponry, which she deploys to get ahead in the world. And it's no surprise that she shares a sort of satisfied half smile with the viewer, who again she turns to and addresses. Tiso evokes a world of social display in which men and women dress to attract interest and are aware of being looked at. They've gone to be on, they've gone wherever, you know, they're going to be on display. Although in this painting, the sporting ladies are located in a fashionable circus. Circuses were very, very fashionable in uh, Paris in the 1880s. The audience seems more interested in looking at each other than at the acrobatic performers. The men and women are animated, that sort of frisson, that, that um, uh, electricity that I sort of uh, mentioned before. They're animated and alert, looking through opera glasses, turning to talk to each other, smiling and gossiping. And this lovely detail um, shows you uh, both the, the woman who's looking out at the audience, but also all the women um, in the audience who have their opera glasses apparently trained on each other 
rather than um, the performance. So you can see it's um, the detail in the centre, uh, centre right. Tiso plays with the idea of performance here, as the audience seems to be performing as much as the acrobats. And the picture reveals the layers of display and fashionable consumption involved in being a modern Parisienne. In La Demoiselle du Magasin, another one of this series, The Shop Girl, the woman's gaze is even more explicitly directed towards the viewer of the image, as a young assistant opens the door and holds a parcel for a departing customer. And of course, we are actually put in the position of the departing customer. It seems to us that she's actually holding our purchase and opening the door for us. Again, the image is teeming with textures. Just look at that untidy jumble of fabrics and ribbons on the counter, which seems to invite a, a, a tactile response from the viewer. I mean, as you look at that, it's almost like a still life on the left-hand side. You sort of, you want to rummage and see if those ribbons are knotted or what they feel like. Are they satin or, or what are they made of? But is this all that is on sale in this image. There's another exchange of glances in this picture. As the shop girl locks eyes with the viewer, another assistant reaches up to put a box on a high shelf and looks out of the shop window from where she must surely meet the gaze of the bearded gentleman in the street. Shopping in this period was often associated with sex. Even the phrase for window shopping, lèche vitrine, uh, literally translated as to lick the window, evoked the erotic connotations of modern consumption. Tiso deliberately places the man's head over the torso of the display dummy in the window and the conflation of shop interior and street and of selling fabrics and selling bodies is both unmistakable and unavoidable. Tissot's series, Les Femmes à Paris, evokes a highly charged urban world in which fashion is part of a self-conscious erotic display and where female sexual morality is uncertain or ambiguous and appears as much for sale as the goods in the shop windows. In London, fashionable dress seemed also to have created an environment in which women were bold and assertive, and where the differences between the respectable and the non-respectable had disintegrated. Two episodes in particular, one in 1862 and one in 1868, seem to typify contemporary confusion about modern femininity and also generated massive amounts of public debate in the periodical press and newspapers. And I'm returning here to Frith's 1862 painting of Noon in Regent Street. On the 7th of January, 1862, the Times newspaper published an angry letter from someone calling himself Partifamilias from the provinces. The correspondent explained that his daughter had been the subject of a cowardly assault while walking in the streets of London. As a stranger to the metropolis, he wrote, he'd been surprised by advice from acquaintances that his daughter should be accompanied by a servant or older relative when out in public. He had ignored this advice and was now appalled to inform readers of the paper that his daughter and a female relative had been followed when visiting Oxford Street. It was an outrage, he concluded, that innocent girls couldn't walk in London unaccompanied without being bothered by the stares and comments of scoundrels masquerading as gentlemen. The publication of this letter stimulated an intense debate in the press about men, women, respectability, and streets in mid-Victorian London. 
The first to reply to Paterfamilias was Puella, who declared that she had walked alone in Oxford Street on many occasions and had never received any incivility. Perhaps, she suggested, the provincial girls had incited, invited attention. If country girls want to go shopping, the letter continued, and I quote, dressed in red cloaks and pork pie hats with white feathers, they cannot escape the notice of those despicable idlers who take advantage of the weakness of women. Really respectable women, Puella continued, who do not wish to attract attention, should assume a quiet dress and manner when unaccompanied in the city. So she's sort of saying it's absolutely fine. If you dress modestly, if you don't draw any attention to yourself, nothing will happen to you. So what were these two girls up to? The debate that begins to take shape in the letter columns of the Times reveals how public behaviour and appearance were beginning to shift in the 1860s, and how this, in turn, was creating different kinds of encounters on the streets of the city. The original incident, we only have the letters to go by, wasn't just a question of the blurring of identities between the respectable woman and the prostitute. The idler doesn't mistake the country girls for prostitutes, but for naive young women who may be open to sexual flirtation. This kind of encounter, sortful or uninvited, was a possibility on the streets of the metropolis. Well, part of Familias sprang to the defence of his daughter and her companion and the doubt cast by Puella on their behaviour. He wrote back to the Times saying that they had not incited any advances through their dress because they'd been in plain mourning to respect the recent death of Prince Albert. A few days later, though, another correspondent, calling themselves Common Sense, offered another interpretation of the incident. Girls nowadays go out and are deliberately flirtatious, and part of Familias had better come to terms with it. The letter imagines the behaviour of part of Familias's girls that day, and this was a letter published uh, in the Times on the 21st of January, 1862. Fathers cannot believe, it suggests, that Blanche ever looked kindly at a strange jolly garçon who appeared struck with her appearance, or that Isabel ever designedly showed rather more than her very neat ankle to a young officer crossing the street. It never occurs to them that bonnets of the kiss-me-quick kind, loud stockings, exaggerated tournure, um, that sort of uh, bustles, capes and crinolines, vagrant ringlets straying over the shoulder, better known as follow-me lads, and such like decoys are all unmistakably intended to attract the notice and attention of the male sex. Blanche and Isabel, they've made up those names, take a good deal of notice of the young men in a quiet way when they walk out alone and are not at all displeased of being taken notice of themselves. Many little harmless and interesting adventures may occur to the dear girls during their morning walks, of which they say nothing at all when they return home. <laughs> the problem is, then, that respectable girls aren't staying put. They walk unaccompanied in the West End of London, and this can provide sought-after opportunities for sexualized encounters, so kind of flirty encounters with strangers. On the streets, details of dress, gesture, and glance are ambiguous and can convey social status or flirtatious availability. And now I want to go back to this picture because in the light of this cacophony of voices and opinions, we can look again at these two women in the centre of Frith's panorama of noon in Regent Street. So we've got this wonderful sort of crowd scene, a modern life scene of the most fashionable street in London, 
at, at, at the moment in the day when it was most um, lively, but also associated with prostitutes, who are these women? Why does the crossing sweeper tip his hat, perhaps rather ironically? Why does the girl leading the blind man look at them? Who are they looking at? I think we can be confident that whatever uncertainties we may have about their identity were shared by the people on the streets and in the art galleries in the mid-19th century. I think ambiguity is precisely what these two figures are about. The fallout from the incident spread to the illustrated periodical press and offered punch the opportunity for some misogynistic digs at one of their favourite comic types, the unattractive spinster. So this was published in February 1862. Um, Prudence, Matilda with the hat. Well, dear, no one ever presumed to address me. Still, after all the letters in the papers, no girl of prepossessing appearance should ever go out unprotected. And she's got the little servant boy, the rather jaunty little servant boy, um, to protect her from, um, obviously, no one is going to talk to her. Uh, Mistaken Identity, punched also, uh, published also in Punch in February 1862, Terrified Spinster, Oh, Mr. Policeman, I do believe here is one of those ruffinly libertines about to speak to me. So, uh, you know, it was an easy, it was an easy joke. And the um, unattractive spinster was, you know, just, uh, it was easier to poke fun at ugly old women than for Punch to come to terms with the confusion on the streets of modern cities. There's one last element in this discourse on streets sexuality and sight that introduces a woman who is also to play a central part in the later debate of 1868. In April 1862, so this is, you know, a good four months after the original letter, the journal Temple Bar published an article called Out Walking by the novelist and journalist Eliza Lynn Linton. The piece suggests that if a woman behaves and dresses properly, if she doesn't linger in front of shop windows, if she walks with purpose, doesn't attract attention, and ignores passing men, then she is perfectly safe and at home in the city. So, you know, you have to keep moving. If you stop and start looking in shop windows, you you become subject to this world of temptation and seduction. So you have to dress modestly, keep moving, and don't look around you. Any sign that women are enjoying the city, that they are participating in its visual culture and ocular freedom, can be taken as a sign of their lack of modesty. London in the 1860s was a dynamic and changing society. The only way for conservative models of femininity to be maintained within this environment was to prove them resistant to the seductions of the the city's visual temptations, to place women in the city, but not of the city, on the streets, but withdrawn from their specular and erotic exchange. This is Linton's conclusion in Out Walking. The truly modest woman is, and I quote, unobtrusive, gentle, womanly. She is just the person to slip through a crowd unobserved, like one of those soft grey moths in the evening, which come and go upon their way, unseen by men and undevoured by birds. Now, Linton's advice might be easier to swallow had she not in her own life challenged conservative models of Victorian femininity. In 1845, at the age of 23, she left her home in Cumberland to go to live alone in London in order to study at the British Museum and to become a writer. Linton took rooms in a private boarding house near the museum and made regular journeys through the metropolis to visit family friends 
and she became a journalist and mixed in a really radical intellectual circle. She was an advanced woman in advanced circles. In 1858, she married William James Linton, who was a wood engraver and bohemian. She was the main wage earner in the family, and when the marriage finally disintegrated and William and the family migrated to America, Linton focused on her writing and her career really took off. In 1868, the Saturday Review published her articles on the girl of the period, and her professional reputation was established. Throughout her life and her career, Linton drew an energy from the city. In her autobiographical novel, she wrote, In London you live, in the country you breathe. And yet, in a follow-up essay to The Girl of the Period, she berated, and I quote, modern maidens for shamelessly beating the pavements of the city. Now, to describe Linton's views as hypocritical or contradictory, I think is to read her position and the environment, the context, too crudely. At no point in her journalism did she deny lone women the right to be pedestrians in the city. But she imposed very exacting limits. What she denied women was the very pleasure and enjoyment that she so clearly derived herself from walking in the city. So, here we have um, a visualisation of the girl of the period, a music, music sheet cover from around 1868 to 9. And what I want you to look at are the details of this dress, this very um, elaborate sort of trimmings and bustle, the little feet, the preposterous hairstyle, um, and with this great long plait with the little ribbon at the end. The hat, the idea of, of wildlife on your hat, was something that was often associated with the um, dress preferences of the girl of the period, and also the cigarette. Um, the rather little cheeky glance is also something that becomes very much part of um, the dress of the girl of the period. The Girl of the Period was published in the Saturday Review on the 14th of March, 1868. It wasn't the first time that the paper had addressed what had become known as the woman question. But this was the most lancing attack thus far on the manners and morals of modern girls. The article was published anonymously but didn't hold its punches. Its title referred to the fashionable, fast young women of the respectable middle classes who were neglecting their domestic duties and copying the dress and manners of the demi-monde. They no longer cared about male respect, but preferred bold talk and flirtation. And I think you've all been given um, a single sheet which has some quotes from the article. Um, I'll read them out in case you can't see in this light, but some of you may be able to, to follow them. This is how it begins. Time was when the phrase, a fair young English girl, meant the ideal of womanhood. We prided ourselves as a nation on our women. We thought we had the pick of creation in this fair young English girl of ours and envied no other men their own. We admired the languid grace and subtle fire of the South. The docility and childlike affectionateness of the East seemed to us sweet and simple and restful. The vivacious sparkle of the trim and sprightly Parisienne was a pleasant little excitement when we met with it in its own domain. But our allegiance never wandered from our brown-haired girls at home, and our hearts were less vagrant than our fancies. This was in the old time, when English girls were content to be what God and nature had made them. The author, Eliza Lynn Linton, described in detail the appearance and style of this new type of woman. She dyed her hair and wore cosmetics. Her clothes were vulgar and extravagant, with calf-length skirts and outrageous bonnets. And this is the second paragraph for those of you who are following the text. 
The girl of the period is a creature who dyes her hair and paints her face as the first articles of her personal religion. A creature whose sole idea of life is fun, whose sole aim is unbounded luxury, and whose dress is the chief object of such thought and intellect as she possesses. Her main endeavour is to outvie her neighbours in the extravagance of fashion. So you get words like fun, luxury, extravagance. This is, these are the principles, the guiding principles of modern girls. The problem, though, wasn't simply a question of poor taste in clothes. And this goes back to the point, again, that I made at the beginning, which is about the relationship between dress and morality. As the article spelt out, she cannot be made to see that modesty of appearance and virtue ought to be inseparable, and that no good girl can appear, afford to appear bad under the penalty of receiving the contempt awarded to the bad. The risk was that if the girls of the wealthy middle classes imitated the dress of the demimonde, they might also begin to adopt their manners and sexual morality. Um, and she wrote, it leads to slang, bold talk and fastness, to the love of pleasure and indifference to duty, to the desire of money before true love and happiness, in a word, to the worst forms of luxury and selfishness. So it, it's a really um, extended attack on this particular class of well-off young women who seem to have severed this relationship between the way you look and your moral behaviour, who you are. And they're now sort of rubbing shoulders with the style of the demimonde, but not recognising the risk that they are um, taking by doing this. As soon as the article appeared, it aroused a storm of fury. The phrase, the girl of the period, I mean, it just it became a catchword in cartoons, plays and novels and became the centre of attention both in Britain and America. Shortly after its publication in the Saturday Review, the Gentleman's Magazine, Echoes from the Clubs, published a double-page cartoon contrasting, and we've got the slide up here, um, modest femininity and its vulgar counterpart. So on the one hand, on the left, you can see um, an extremely demure young mother playing with her children in um, sight of her husband. Um, and she's, of course, also in the home. So she's not out in this kind of much more risky environment of the streets. And then on, uh, the other, in the other um, image, uh, a boldly dressed, this rather sort of, again, extravagance. It's about luxury, accessories, um, extravagance, fun. Um, this boldly dressed and made up woman who's escorted, and I think we can go back to Men in Black, the subject of the first um, uh, lecture, this lascivious swell with monocle and monster sideburns. And of course, she's in the street with a, a little advert for um, the Saturday Review, Girls of the Period. And just under that, a poster advertising performances of La Traviata, just in case you haven't um, read her identity properly. Um, a later collection of cartoons from this publication included this full-page um, Sisters of Circe, in which three modern girls at the centre are named in an accompanying poem, The Three Disgraces. Um, and you can see the little vignettes. First of all, you can see, um, I'm sure you can uh, immediately identify the, the, the different elements of their dress. Um, the woman with a bird in her hat, the shorter skirts, the kind of detail, the extravagance, the rather sort of flaunting appearance. Um, and then the sort of little vignettes which make up the, um, the world of the girl of the period. Um, the pretty horsebreaker, Rotten Row, um, smoking, um, even when she's indoors. You know, this is the, the world and the environment of um, the three disgraces. 
But I think the message of the image is complicated by the satirical tone of the accompanying poem because it's unclear which version of femininity the readers of Echoes from the Clubs are being invited to admire. In the same year, another magazine was launched aimed at young female readers and called The Girl of the Period. And I've got some uh, images here from the magazine. This is, um, they, they, they do um, articles on all types of girls of the period. This is the fast smoking girl of the period. Um, and you can again, she's chalking up a billiard cue. Um, and, you know, you can see that, you know, very fashionable dress again. Um, so it, it sort of explores all aspects of modern femininity. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, it was a fairly short lived publication, but it sort of satirizes and it's a very inwardly uh, knowing uh, satire about the girl of the period for a knowing and well-informed audience. Um, this, is, this is an article I really liked. It's a series, actually, and I wish I could show you all of them. This is um, a, a, a serialised dictionary of slang, Contributions to a Dictionary of the Future, compiled by Miss Polly Glott. And the entries included, and I quote, advances... A series of actions calculated to render anyone agreeable to a person of the opposite sex. Formerly, advances were made by gentlemen, but this absurd custom is now exploded. Affectionate, loving, in this sense somewhat antiquated, indifferent to, not caring a jot for, etc. So it's, it, it's wonderful, I mean, it's just sort of satire sending up this, this whole um, style of the girl of the period. And, of course, the magazine paid tribute to the girl of the period's French counterpart, the Parisienne, which is described, who is described here as, quote, the supreme result of civilization. William Powell Frith's painting at Homburg 1869, and he dates it at Homburg 1869 in the title, exhibited in the immediate aftermath of the Saturday Review Furore, draws together many of these ideas concerning the girl of the period. It depicts a gorgeously dressed, unaccompanied woman accepting a light for a cigarette from a waiter. The shock of the painting is that she is probably not a fallen woman, but that she is a respectable woman who is resisting the narrow constraints of domestic femininity. In this respect, Frith's canvas is truly a painting of modern life. Respectability is shown to be merely a play of style. Manners and morals have become detached from each other, as the critic of one of Tissot's canvases helplessly observed, not a lady in a score of female figures. What was the debate about the girl of the period really about? What was really at stake in these endless accounts of the changing styles of contemporary femininity? It's perhaps no coincidence that the debate took place in the same years as John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women was published. Mill argued for equality between the sexes in all respects. The 1867 Reform Act had extended the franchise to all male householders, but women were still excluded. Mill argued that women had an equal right to the vote and stated, and I quote, the legal subordination of one sex to another is wrong in itself and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. It ought to be replaced by a system of perfect equality admitting no power and privilege on the one side, nor disability on the other. Now, we may now mistakenly regard the women's movement as a 20th century campaign. But the struggle for women's rights was particularly active from the end of the 18th century and throughout the 19th century. Although women continued to be denied the vote, in the second half of the 19th century, there was 
a gradual removal of gender inequalities and improved access to education. Millicent Garrett Fawcett became the co-founder in 1871 of Newnham College, Cambridge, and her sister, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, became the first female member of the British Medical Association in 1873. In this context of the increasing presence of powerful women in the public sphere, the girl of the period became a counter figure of weak, superficial femininity, incapable of equality, and without the discernment or the intelligence to vote. It was a type that could be mobilized with equal force, both by those who opposed female equality and those who supported it and condemned the way that young women had been seduced by fashion. We've become accustomed to seeing the Victorians as the quaint and occasionally comic counterpart to 20th and 21st century modernity. The case of the girl of the period demonstrates that the 19th century was more complex than we've hitherto allowed it to be, and bears stronger connections to our own time than we've perhaps previously acknowledged. Do we not continue to see dress and appearance as signs of moral worth, a habit which is borne out every day on the streets of our cities and towns? We might therefore bear in mind the lesson of the girl of the period. Appearances are deceptive and people aren't always what they seem. In this series of lectures, I've tried to explore the ways in which fashionable dress was regarded as a symbol of the fleeting and transitory nature of modern life and a system for de defining social and moral identities. On the streets of the new cities, strangers came into contact with, with each other and everyone could be said to be on show. It was a world which needed clarity and difference, but in which certainty was breaking down. Gentlemen, swells and clerks, shop assistants, courtesans and modern girls of the period were part of an expanding cast of men and women who engaged in the pleasures of the city and who we can now try and recapture in the cartoons and paintings of the period. Thank you very much.